I want to welcome all those who are watching online, the ladies at God Behind Bars. We love you, those who are watching online, wherever you are, and those at our campuses here in DeSoto County, Olive Branch, South Haven, yes, and our uh, Dream Center out at uh, Horn Lake and also at Hernando. Welcome this morning to the weekend. This is our fifth week in the series, and I hope that you have been able to make each week. We've been talking about what matters, and And pretty much we've been talking about things that are foundational. Nothing mind-blowing really, but things that are foundational because if you've ever built a house, you know that everything depends on the foundation. You can have a beautiful house, but if the foundation is messed up, you will see cracks and you will see problems uh, going forward. And so we've been talking about foundational things like where we came from and how we were designed, our image and our purpose in life. And this weekend, I'd like to talk to you about this idea that belonging to a community of faith matters. I want to start by saying something that that Alden mentioned in her testimony. Some of you have been hurt by church, and as I progress through this, this it's not my notes, but I felt like I needed to pray for you before we even get started. And, And if you've heard my story, you know there's probably very few people that I know that have more church hurt than me. I mean, it... it It's just ugly, okay? I get it. But I got to a point in my life where I had to realize that I can either hold on to the hurt and the pain or I can release it to God. And and, and for some of you who have been hurt by church, before we even get into understanding the power and the reason why community matters so much, you can't get over this obstacle. And I just want to challenge you right now to release that to God because you're either going to hold on to it and make you bitter or you're going to release that and it will make you better. I want to challenge you to let go of that and let, let God's love fill you up. One of the things that many people don't realize is that the church belongs to Jesus Christ. And, and when you hear things like the church is, he's coming for his bride and it's going to be perfect, it's going to be spotless. And then you look around, you see a, a church that is not, a church that is less than, you wonder how can these things be? Well, the Bible teaches us that the church is the body of Christ and Christ is the head. And the head, who is Christ, is in heaven. Where there is no sin, there's no stench of flesh, there's no evil greed or desires of man. There is only God's perfect will. And he exists there as the head. And we as the body are attached to him, but we are in this earth. We are still being conformed into his image. We are still being perfected by him. We are still fallen, but we are becoming perfected by his grace. Amen? So that's why there are hurts. It's not because of your heavenly father. It's not because of Jesus. It's because we are still becoming perfected. And so I ask that you would give the grace that you so richly received from Jesus and understand that before you can really receive a truth, you have to let go of this pain. And so Jesus, I pray right now for anyone listening that that has a hurt and a pain from church, God, that you would begin the process of healing them so that they can hear the truth rather than the lie, dear God, that they'll let go of the excuse and receive the love of Jesus Christ in your name. Amen. I want to talk to you about belonging to community because I'm going to tell you, I believe that that is one of the most deficient areas of our spiritual life is our understanding of the power and the impact of community on our personal faith. Uh, Psychologist Philip Zimbardo, who is also a professor at Stanford and also uh, a believer in Jesus, said this, I know of no more potent killer than isolation. There is no more destructive influence on the physical and mental health than the isolation of you from me and us from them. Anybody understand that? We're seeing that in our world today. There is this isolationism. There is this divisiveness that we see in this world. And it is very intentional. And it has mental and emotional and social effects as well as physical effects on people today. But he goes on. The devil's strategy for our times is to trivialize human existence. Anybody seeing that? If I don't recognize the image of Christ in me, then I'm not going to recognize it in you and I'm going to treat you less than you are. And it's easy for me to do when I'm isolated from you. I trivialize human existence and beyond that, he says, uh, all the while causing us to think 
that the reason why we're isolated from each other is simply because of time and pressure and work and economic uncertainties. When the reality is the reason why you and I get isolated from one another is because we have a spiritual enemy who hates us and he has a strategy called isolation. And it started from the very beginning. Many times I've said this before, we think we have advanced so much. We think we are a progressive people. We think we are constantly moving chronologically and also linearly up and to the right when in reality we are regressing in many ways. One of the ways we're regressing is the fact that we still don't get the enemy's strategy even though it was clear and obvious from the very beginning. In the book of beginnings, he separated in the Garden of Eden, in the place of perfection, Adam from Eve and there he tempted Eve alone. The Bible shows us as it opens up in the new covenant that Jesus went out into the wilderness alone and there the enemy tempted him. He always tries to get us isolated from one another so that he can separate us from hope. And he can accentuate the lie that we tend to believe when we are isolated that God just simply doesn't care. And he perpetuates the idea that comes into our mind, especially as proud Americans, that we don't need anyone. We can do it on our own. The devil knows that if he can get people isolated and separated from life-giving relationships and community, then you will not hear the truth you need to hear about God, your fellow man, nor about yourself. You will not have burdens and pains and hurts to share with one another. And you will not fulfill the purpose and the destiny that God has for your life. I want to tell you, the reason why community is so important, first of all, is because the enemy's strategy is just the opposite to separate us and to isolate us. And that's why I propose this at the beginning of this message at the top of your handout. I believe the reason why so many Christians have failed to beat bad habits and have failed to, to conquer the sinful patterns in their life. I believe the reason why we've not successfully experienced our God-given destiny nor fulfilled our purpose in Christ can be directly related to the degree to which we are willing to belong or not belong to the community of faith. Now again, you, you've, got to, you've got to reconcile some church hurt. I get it, some of you. And so God's grace on you during this. And I want to be as sensitive as possible. But I want you to understand something. The devil is really trying to chew on your ear and your heart. And you need to recognize his voice and separate it from the voice of truth. Let's just follow along, if you will, uh, through the path that we've already began to cut in this whole idea of what truly matters, all right? So, so we talked about this, and I want to I spread it out here for you. First of all, God created me. I believe that, right? Anybody believe God created? I, I've told you before, this is where it has to start. If you start anywhere else in here, you will ultimately question the things that you believe. You have to start right here. I believe that God created me. He designed me. He divinely and intentionally purposed me. He created me in a special way. Therefore, I trust in his standards, the ones that he established for me. I, I, I trust in the way and the path that he's laid out through his word and through the life of Jesus, which quite naturally leads me to freedom. Why? Because remember in the garden, he, he, he was, he, the enemy uh, supposed that, that they were living in bondage when in reality they were living in freedom because they were following the ways of God before sin. Not only that, but because I trust in the standards of God and because I experience the freedom of God, I live by his design. And because I live by his design, it naturally, throughout the Bible, you will see, it leads me into community with other believers, into community with people who can help me form and fashion and hold me accountable to my faith. This is where it naturally leads when I live according to the standards of God and when I surrender to his design for my life, I will naturally be drawn to the community of people. You think about it, again, we talked about intentions versus direction last week and how many people intend to live for God, but they live in communities and are, are informed by communities that are anything but God. And yet they come on the weekend trying to change all that that community has told or trying to reconcile it to what they understand about God. Anybody with me? Hey, we've got to be consistent in this because the other side of the coin is this. Stay with me. If I do not believe that there's a God who created me, or if I do believe but don't live my life as if a God created me, 
then, then here's what's going to happen. I'm going to begin again to trust my standards and live by my own desires and what serves me best. And we already learned from Adam and Eve that leads to bondage. The enemy lied to us and said it was freedom, but it was actually bondage. And when I do live like that, living my own self-serving desires, it naturally leads to isolation and shame. Follow Adam and Eve in the garden. When God came to them after they had rebelled against him, God called their names out. And where were they? They ran and they hid. They ran away. They, they ran into isolation, away from community, from the presence of God, from communion with him, into isolation, to hide from the very one who could redeem them. They hid. And not only did they hide, but they hid in shame. They fashioned fig leaves and tied them around themselves because they weren't just isolating themselves from community with God. They were isolating themselves from community with one another. And there was shame that's involved in isolation. And you wonder why there's so much depression in the world today. You don't have to wonder very long. Amen. So here's the deal. You and I need to understand that community matters because the enemy knows that community matters. So we're not just talking about community, though. You can belong to a lot of community. We're talking about belonging to the community of faith, not just attending church. So I want to talk to you about this, and I want you to see at the top of your handout. To belong is to be rightly placed in a specific position. And we, we've talked about this, and you've seen this, especially with everything that's going on with COVID. We see more and more and more that belonging to one another, belonging in community is more and more important to our physiological, our psychological, and our societal uh, good and benefit. We need to belong, and we want to belong to something. In fact, we find out how important it is when we see all these ailments and diseases that more and more and more are being revealed in our, our world that are attached specifically to unhealthy relationships and to isolation. Harvard professor Robert Putnam wrote a book about 20 years ago, or maybe longer than that, called Bowling Alone. And he did this just to point out the fact that there are all sorts of physical, emotional, and societal problems with living in isolation. He called it Bowling Alone because he recognized that today people are bowling more than ever before, but they're not bowling in leagues and they're not bowling together. They are bowling alone. And so he uses this sort of imagery in order to set his research, research of over 500,000 interviews done over a period of 25 years, which revealed that we are in a moral and social deficit as it relates to connectivity and relatedness in community. He noticed that, that, that attendance in clubs and meetings as that are down 58%. Eating with your family down 33%. Uh, having friends over is down 45% in the last 25 years. There's all sorts of problems that have been connected to this social deficit. He calls a lack of social capital. That is, we are connected far less than we ever have been in the history of our country and our society. And he says it is causing all sorts of problems from lower grades to all sorts of, of improprieties that, that children and teenagers are involving and engaging themselves into higher crime, to greater depression. And here's the deal. We are making today all sorts of, of relational connections and opportunities available to people far easier now through the internet and technology However, the irony is that the connection that we are encouraging them to make is virtual and not relational. So while we are filling out our social profiles and, and posting information about ourselves and our likes and our dislikes on social media and our photos and our online diaries about our life and about all the things that are going on in our day, we are creating an identity and community, but it is not at all the same as the community that we are to belong to. You can't belong to a virtual community. Amen? So there's more research than I can get into, more than we could talk about for a whole series on the lack of, 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 of the deficiency that is in us physically, emotionally, and society uh, in terms of, of, of having relationship. But you know where it all comes from? It comes from God. 
You see, long before it was a physical need or a social society need or, or a psychological need, it was a spiritual need. In the very beginning, in, 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 in the, the book of beginnings, in, in, in the state of perfection, before sin had ever entered into the world, God placed inside of us a need to belong to one another in spiritual community. God placed inside of us with these words, before Eve was even there yet, in the Garden of Eden, after he created everything and said, it is good, it is very good, he then said, it is not good that man should be alone. Now, specifically, the Bible says, so he created Eve, who was just right for him. So specifically, that's what he was talking about. But broadly, he was talking about one another. He was talking about community just as much. He said it's not good. And so with that statement, God placed inside of us a need that is so basic and yet so vital that he alone could satisfy it. And since God created you and I by design, and since he created us so uniquely, it only makes sense because of God's intentionality that what he created you and I to belong to is as important as that he created us to belong. Does that make sense? Our God didn't create us and then just send us as a speck of dust into space. He created us uniquely, especially, and designed us very intricately, not just so we could belong, but he also created that which he wanted us to belong to. Do you understand? You and I as a Christ follower can join a club. We can become a member of a group. We can serve on the board of an organization. You can try out for a team. But none of those things is, is nearly the same as belonging to a community of faith. There's nothing wrong with those things. I just don't want you to think they're the same. Because many times we treat Belonging to the church as if it's the same as belonging to an organization, a club, or a board. And it is not at all the same. I want you to see the difference because God uniquely created you to belong to his body. You see, this is one of the three analogies that's used in the New Testament to describe the church, a building, the bride. And most commonly, it's referred to as the body. First chapter, First Corinthians chapter 12 Paul is actually teaching us about the church by using the analogy of a physical body. He not only tells us what the church is through the body, but he tells us how the church is interrelated and connected in community, spirit-filled community through the body. I, I encourage you later on to take the whole chapter in and digest it and take notes on it, but I just want to pull out a few verses for us to discuss. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 and 18, we'll start there. The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. I, how many of you love the diversity of Christ's body? And I'm not talking about just race. I'm talking about not just sex or gender. I'm talking about the diversity of stories and religious backgrounds. I'm so glad that we're not all Baptist. I'm so glad that we're not all Pentecostal. I'm so glad we're not all Catholic. I'm just so glad that Compel Church is made up of a diversity of people. Every one of you have a different background, a different story. You, you even have different ideologies and things like that. Can I tell you something? God is not scared of diversity. God uses diversity to create unity. You understand that? And I, I love that about the body of Christ here at Compel Church. There are certain things that we believe and we must. They are essential for community. But there are other things that are not so important that we can discuss and we can talk about. But your story and where you come from and your background, all of those things matter. Amen? So I love it because we're all individual, but we make up one whole body. Look at this. And God has put each part just where he wants it. Think about it. You're a part of the body of Christ. And God has placed you here just where he wants you to be. Are you doing what he wants you to do is the follow-up question. Look at this, verses 20 and 21. Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. So the eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. There's a lot of people that, that hop around their bunny church Christian. You know, they're just hopping from church to church trying to find a place that suits their needs. And the Bible tells us very clearly that where you are, you are needed. Understand, you can't become who God has intended you to become without a little friction, 
The seed doesn't come out of the ground unless the, 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 the shell of that seed is cracked open. At some point, it's got to be a little friction, right? So you got to understand, you need one another. The eyes can't say to the feet, I don't need you. Just because you can see where you're going, you ain't going to get there without the feet, right? You need one another. And so that's very important. And then finally, look at this, verse 26 and 27 from 1 Corinthians 12. If one part suffers, all parts suffer with it. You ever hit your thumb with a hammer? You ever close it in a door? Your whole body, oh, God! Your whole body comes around. You put it in your mouth as if that's going to help. You know, you, you do whatever you can. Your body compensates for pain. If one part honors, they're all honored. Look at this. This is important. All of you together are Christ's body. What did Alden say in her testimony? I can be a Christian without the church. Let me be very clear because a lot of people dance around this. No, you can't. Now, you can do Christian activities. You can read the Bible. You can pray. Yeah, that's Christian activity. But the role that you fulfill as a part of the body of Christ, you must do together. He says here, all of you together are Christ's body. I've never been so bold as to say it like that. But Paul gave me a little courage here because he said it first. Yes, you can do Christian activities. But you cannot be fully everything God has called you to be outside of the body of Christ. Now, again, listen to me. Some of you are thinking, well, I can't go to church. I've got some physical problems. I didn't say go to church. I didn't say attend. I said belong. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. So you're together, and each of you is a part of it. Let's look at Romans chapter 12, one more passage. Because Paul is writing this as well, and he continues the analogy of the body of Christ. He says, just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body and we all belong to each other. Oh, we don't like this. I don't want to belong to nobody but me. This is the world in which we live today. We, we think that we are truer to our, our identity when we are apart from community and we are our own unique selves. And that's what our society tells us. That's why we're seeing all this divisiveness. But the truth is, and tradition has always shown, that part of who you are, truly, you will never understand your identity until you understand how you work within the community in which you're placed. God placed you in a community to help you understand who you are. You belong to me and I belong to you. We belong to one another because we are Christ's bodies. We don't belong to ourselves. You see why this is not like being a part of the key club. This is not joining the chamber of commerce. Okay, this is bigger than that. And that's why we need to take it more seriously. Amen. We belong to one another. You say, Patrick, wait a minute. You're talking about the body of Christ. You're talking about our role in it. Why are you doing that? We are right here in front of you. Why do you need to tell us? We know. We're here, aren't we? It's a big difference between being here and belonging. Big difference between attending and belonging to the body of Christ. Remember what I said earlier, the proposition of my whole message is pretty strong in that I was saying many of us can't break free from bondage and sin and all sorts of problems and we are not living the fulfilled purpose of God and we wonder why the church is not performing up to our expectations in part because we are simply attending and we don't belong. There's a big difference between the two. You see, there's some benefits to belonging. Anybody know? I just mentioned someone being broken free from sin and living in the freedom of Christ. That's a huge benefit. But with those benefits come some responsibilities. There are some things that are required of you and I that merely attending the church is not required of. So I want to talk to you about that as we sort of bring this thing uh, to a close, and, and it's in your handout there. I want to talk to you about what it means to belong to something. I'm going to give you several illustrations because I want you to see this. We see it so clearly when it comes to other organizations and groups. But somehow many of us miss it when it becomes the community of Christ that he has formed and fashioned you for. First of all, put in your handout, when I belong to someone or something, I'm identified by them. Are you with me? I'm identified. Let me give you a couple of examples, okay? My wife. I belong to my wife. 
And, and I'm identified by her. I'm identified as her husband. I'm identified uh, as her protector, her provider. I'm the father of her children. There's an identity that is attached to me because I belong to her and she belongs to me. We are now one and my identity in a large part is in relationship to belonging to her. Secondly, uh, think about our children. Anybody belong to your children? You ever seen somebody like, whose children do they belong to? <laughs> Who are these children? And the reality is you belong to your children. Your children belong to to you. I am their father, their mentor, the disciplinarian, their authority figure. I must put aside childish things and immature desires of my own flesh so I can become the man that they require of me. My identity is attached to that which I belong to. How many of you are employed? Golly. There's some problems. <laughs> no, pray for South Haven. They are in trouble. Okay. How many of you are employed? Even if you don't like it. See, you don't even want to identify with your employer. The reality is that many of us drive employee cars. We have to wear employee badges. In some way, we identify with the company that we're employed with. How many of you belong to Christ? Okay, a little better. A lot of unemployed heathens here. <laughs> you belong to Christ, right? The Bible tells us in 1 Peter 2, 9 that we are, we are identified in him. We are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, belonging to God. It's a part of your identity. So let me ask you something. If, if belonging to our family and to our children and to our job and to Christ is, is, is an important aspect of that is being identified to them. Let me ask you, how are you identified with the body of Christ? How are you currently, and there's some blanks there, I want you to think about this. How are you identified with the community of faith? I've met people in the grocery store and other places in public and they're like, hey, hey, I go to your church. Oh, really? What church is that? Uh, Compel? Okay. So how long have you been coming? Two years. Two years and it's still my church and it's not your church? I, you laugh. That's a lot of people at Compel Church still believe this is not their church. And it's easy to believe that. And I'm going to challenge you. If you will let this church become your church, it will be a lot better. You love the worship better. You love the ministries better. You love the preaching better. You just let this church become your church, but you're scared to identify with the church because there's responsibilities that come along with that. Right? Let's just be honest. Listen, you ever got a rental car? Do you treat that like your brand new car you just bought? <laughs> nah, you don't. You get in that thing. I don't, I don't see no potholes. I don't, I don't care. Right? You see, you respect and honor that which you belong to much more that which you rent. It's easy to attend here. And the only benefit you get out of that is you can say to yourself, well, I feel a little less guilty. At least I went to church this week, as if that means anything. It means something when you belong. Amen? When you identify. I know this is a little heavy for the beginning of the year. If you don't want to come back next week, it just proved that you didn't belong. Amen? Amen? Look, I love you, but I, this is what we're about with true talent. And I promise you, if you will identify with the church, if you will belong to it, you will, the benefits of the body of Christ will belong to you. But if it doesn't matter, you're going to keep on going through the cycle. Amen? You say, how do we belong? I don't know. It could be a number of ways. But, I mean, you know, on weekends when you're at ball games, why not wear your compelled shirt and compelled gear? We've got compelled socks. Wear them with some sandals and show up at the soccer game. I don't care. But the reason why I say that is not to grow this church. It's to grow you. Because when people come to you and begin to ask you about what is Compel, or you go to Compel, whatever, you say, yes, I go, that's my church. And then you invite them. And when they come, you tell them where you're sitting. Because how many of you know you're sitting in the same place you were last time you came? That could have been three weeks ago, but you're still in the same place. I know at Olive Branch... Y'all, everybody turn around and look at St. 
stage right, that left corner entry door. People drop off their kids and they're sitting right there. Look at how it's filled up. I know where you sit. I was there last week. You sit in the same place, so here's what you need to do. Own it. Own your row. And you say, well, I'm not that kind of person. Well, just shake somebody's hand. Just learn their names. Just ask them about their kids. Ask them where they're from. Just begin to own a little bit at a time. And a little bit at a time will begin to own you until you belong. Amen? Number two, when I belong to something or someone, I'm accountable to them. Now, let's use these same examples. When it comes to, I belong to my wife, okay? So to some extent, I'm accountable to her. And she's accountable to me. We support each other. We encourage each other. We believe the best about one another. But there are times in our relationship where one of us is out of line or maybe needs a little direction and encouragement. And I'm accountable to give that to her. She's accountable to give that to me because we want the best for each other. We're in community and we belong to one another. My children, I'm accountable to them. I'm accountable as their father to act responsibly and to be an excellent example in my decisions in life. I also must hold my children accountable to the values that I've raised them to in the house and the family. My job, how many are accountable to your job? I'm accountable to a code of behavior. I'm accountable to a certain standard of excellence in work. I'm accountable to the board for that. You're accountable to your supervisors for that. How many of you are accountable to Christ? It's a part of our relationship with Him. I'm accountable to Him and His Word. We talked about His Word and the life of Christ are the standards by which I measure myself and by which I will ultimately be judged at the end of days. So if belonging to my family and my job and Christ requires a level of accountability, then let me ask you, how are you accountable to the community of faith in which you belong? How are you accountable? There's a blank there. I just want you to think about it. You see, I believe, going back to 1 Corinthians 12, 18, that God placed you right where you are for a specific reason. There's a specific task. You are here by design, and you are here on mission. You are not here just to warm a seat. You are not here just to check off a little list of what you did this week. You are here by design and you are here on mission and you will be held accountable to that. You are specifically matched to a desire that God wants to fulfill in this particular body of Christ. Some of you gray-haired, some of you older, seasoned seniors, man, I invite you. We need you now more than ever before I need your voice, your life experience. I need your wisdom. I need your mentoring. We're all about the next generation this year, and that means we need you. Step up. Help us out. You say, Patrick, how? Call me or get in touch with Rachel Miller and have her get in touch with me. Let's get together. Amen? I, I'm, I'm, we're ready to roll, and we need everybody on board. Amen? Okay. Here's... here's I'm on board. I'm ready to go. God has placed you just where he wants you to go. And listen to me. You're here so that you can grow spiritually and so that you can help other people around you grow spiritually. Ephesians 4.16 says, He makes the whole body fit together. Here's Paul again talking about the body. Fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work. As you do your part, you help others grow. And in the meantime, you grow as well, healthy and growing and full of love. What what do I need to do? I don't know. Maybe you need to join a small group. Maybe you say, well, I've been in small groups before and I just don't. Listen to me. There's somebody that needs to hear your voice. And no matter how far along you are on the spiritual spectrum, you need to hear somebody else's voice. I remember when I got called into ministry, I was just a sales rep for Hormel. I didn't know anything. And, and I knew God called me into ministry. And this man came up behind me. I was praying at the altar. He didn't know what I was praying about, but I was, I was emotional. I was, I was single. I didn't know what to do next. I knew God had called me into ministry. put his arm around me. He says, son, God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. You just rest in that. And I remember, whew. Man, just such a peace came over me. But thank God he was there. 
Because I didn't have a dad. I didn't have anybody. I was out here by myself. All my family, everybody else is in North Carolina. Well, I didn't have that. And somebody came and became that voice for me. And who will you be that for? Amen? Or maybe you need to sign up to serve at the Dream Center. How many of you know we, the body of Christ, are accountable to serve the underserved and those who can't serve themselves? If we don't do it, what are you waiting on? You waiting on the United Way to do it? Huh? You waiting on Feeding America to come and feed them? No. We have to do it. It's our job. If we don't do it, listen, we can't expect anybody else to. We have something no other group has. We have the power and the love and the compassion of Jesus Christ himself in us. Amen? And finally, let me close with this one. When I belong to something or someone... I'm committed to them. I'm committed. I, when I belong, I'm identified by it. I'm accountable to it. And I'm committed to it. Again, going back to those examples, my, my spouse, it doesn't matter. Through thick and thin, things going up and to the right, things are deteriorating, I'm committed to her. I'm committed to her physically, emotionally, spiritually, financially. I'm committed. I'm all in. I'm not half-hearted. When it comes to my kids, I don't care what boneheaded thing they do. I love them unconditionally. I'm committed to my children because I belong to them and they belong to me. When it comes to my job, I don't do anything half-hearted. I do it as unto the Lord. That's what we're called to do. We do it with everything we've got because I'm committed because I belong here. When it comes to my relationship with Jesus... I belong to him. He belongs to me. And I'm committed to that relationship. I must be, even in my failure, I must understand there's an expectation to be committed. That's why we get water baptized. We go public with our faith. I'm committed. I'm not ashamed. In front of my family, my spiritual family, I commit to God. But even outside of these walls, I commit to my faith in, in worship and in, in, in faith and in work and in deed. I commit. I give it all. In fact... Jesus even said, or Paul even said, rather, in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20, he's talking about commitment. He says, don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself. You were bought with a high price, the price of Jesus Christ. You're not the first one to commit. Amen. He committed all, so we commit all to him. So you see the value of commitment to family, marriage, to jobs, and to Christ. We understand in our life that nothing works unless we are committed to the support structures that allow our life work. If we understand it in those arenas, then how do we not understand it when it comes to being committed to the body of Christ, to the community of faith? He said, what does that look like? Well, I don't know. For some of you, it may mean committing to simply being here consistently. And he said, I don't know about it. You can't have it both ways. You said attendance wasn't the same as belonging. It's not at all. But you will never belong until you first attend. You, you can't. You'll never belong unless you're consistently there. And I know this, being a pastor for 20 plus years, I know that the beginning of many of our spiritual declines begins when we stop attending in a community of faith, whether it be the big gathering on the weekend or the small group gathering. When you're not there and your fellowship is not felt, many times other areas of your life begin to slip away as well. And that's why Paul says in Hebrews 10, 25, and let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his returning is drawing near. Amen? He, he's coming back. And, and I want to, to have a community of people that I can depend on, that are committed, and that I'm committed to as well. Some of you, maybe you need to commit to serving. You've been attending, but you need to serve. And I know all the reasons. I don't have time. It, it's late. You know, I got kids, and I got this. I got, you got a lot of reasons. But again, let's go back to what matters. What really matters in the end? You see, you come and you got, I got all these issues, man. I'm weighed down with all these problems. Can I tell you something that will help you? One of the things that helps you get out from under the weight of your problems and your issues is to bear the image of Christ in the life of somebody else and their issues and their problems. Jesus said he'll take care of you. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10, look at this. For God is not unjust. He will not forget how hard you have worked and ministered to other people. 
He recognizes it. Even when you are weary and tired and you got stuff going on in your life, he watches you and how you minister. And he says, I will take care of you because you have taken care of my own. Amen? Listen, too many Christians are more committed to their, their sports clubs, their, their, their gym memberships and other institutions than they are to the one community that God has uniquely created them, designed them for, and purposed them for. Too many. And I want to tell you this at the beginning of the year is what matters for many of us is to understand that we belong in a community of faith. I was created by God. I was designed by His divine intention. I was redeemed by His Son. And I've been called into a special community of people whereby I fulfill His purposes in this earth. And this community cannot be replicated by social media or a virtual community. It cannot be experienced by other institutions or clubs or organizations. And it cannot be substituted by merely attending. This is the body of Christ. And if you want to belong to it, you've got to come to a place where you ask yourself, am I identified to this community? Am I accountable to this community? And am I committed to this community? I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes as we close. I want to ask you those questions because if you're not, then you're not receiving the benefit of this community. And and you are also not living up to what God has called you to in this community. I realize this is a challenging message. And again, I want to be sensitive because I know people have church hurt and, and people love to just, it's easier to be a critic of the church than a champion of it. I get it. But at some point, at some point, what matters to you? You can't just date the church, the body of Christ, the community of faith. You can't just date it. God wants a commitment. Because it is his body. It is his physical representation in the earth. There is no Jesus in the earth outside of the Holy Spirit and the body of Christ, which is you and I. Jesus is at the right hand of God the Father. So at some point, I've got to belong. Amen? And I want you to know how much it matters. Heads bowed, eyes closed.